Thanks to Brilliant for helping support this episode. Hey crazies, the surface of this basketball is two-dimensional. It's easy to see it's curved from our very three-dimensional point of view. But what if we were tiny two-dimensional beings living on the surface? How would we be able to tell it was curved? And once we know, how are we going to explain it to anyone else? This episode was made possible by generous supporters on Patreon. We're gonna cover some pretty heavy stuff today, but I think you can handle it as, as long as we put it in the right context. Let's start with perception. We might live in three dimensions, but we don't actually see in three dimensions. The only reason we see anything is because light enters our eyes. That light doesn't carry distance information though. It creates a two-dimensional image on the retina. Yes, two-dimensional. We just happen to have two eyes, which means we get two two-dimensional images. This is what your eyes send to your brain as you walk around. There are two images, offset by the distance between your eyes. We call it parallax. The reason you ultimately only see one image in your mind is because your brain is doing a lot of processing first. It overlays the images and looks for differences. The bigger the difference, the closer that thing is. That plus lighting, shadows, and prior knowledge of object sizes all allow the brain to imagine depth. Knowing this though, we can trick the brain. This is a two-dimensional image of a cube. Your screen is 2D, so the image is 2D. It only looks 3D because of artificial lighting and shadows. If I flatten the light, the illusion mostly disappears. But if you've got a pair of these, we can make the 3D effect even more dramatic. This is called a stereoscopic image. One image is red and the other is cyan. Each color filter blocks one of the images and it makes the cube look almost tangible. So we see in two dimensions and imagine in three. Actually, we live in a four dimensional space time. R right, and, and, and therein lies our problem. That fourth dimension can be difficult for us to imagine. Since it's time, we might be tempted to picture a clock attached to axes or something. But it's a lot more useful to picture that time dimension as if it's a space dimension. That's where we get things like space-time diagrams. We've seen in previous videos how powerful those can be. Unfortunately, to draw those, we need to suppress the space dimensions. At most, we can draw two of the three, because the third dimension is taken up by time. It's impossible to draw four perpendicular axes in a three-dimensional picture. And we can't draw four-dimensional pictures. So what do we do? Well, we can avoid pictures altogether and just do math. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that's not very satisfying. The only other option is to try and get the most out of a diagram like this. And the best way to do that is to imagine what it's like to be a lower dimensional being. Let's see what one dimension is like. This is line land. The only directions are forward and backward. Any beings living in this space have only one dimension, a length. From their point of view though, things look a little different. Remember, we live in 3D and see in 2D. Sight is always one dimension down. These creatures live in one dimension, so they see in zero dimensions. Their world looks something like this to them. Since light has no room to spread out, it's always the same brightness. So what they're looking at never changes. It makes the entire concept of sight kind of useless, so they probably never evolved it to begin with. There's also no room for them to move around each other so they can either live comfortably in the length they have, or they can eat each other. <laughs> Dude, sorry, that, that, that was a little dark, sorry. Let's say with our omnipotent powers, we yeah. pop one of these beings out of line land. They're now free to move around in two dimensions and perceive their one dimensional world from the outside with whatever senses they have. Assuming they could understand what was happening, which they probably couldn't, how would they explain it to another being in line land? If line land was actually a giant circle, would these one-dimensional beings be able to measure that curvature from the inside? No. See, one-dimensional spaces like circles only have extrinsic curvature. That's curvature we can only see if we're looking from a higher dimensional space, like this two-dimensional space. What one-dimensional spaces don't have is intrinsic curvature. That's curvature you can measure from inside the space. We could take every point on the circle and map it to every point on this flat line without any distortion 
you just snip the circle and flatten it out. That means there's no intrinsic curvature. But our four-dimensional space-time has intrinsic curvature, and it's the only one we can measure from the inside. So one-dimensional spaces aren't gonna help us. Let's try two dimensions. This is flat land. Any beings living here have a length and a width, but no thickness. They do have room to move around each other, so their behavior is a little more familiar. From our point of view, we can actually see inside their bodies. From their point of view, things look a little different. They live in two dimensions, so they see in one dimension. This is what they look like to each other. Sight is a useful trait. Things would look brighter and larger when they're closer, and they would look dimmer and smaller when they're farther away. Having two eyes would have the same benefit to them that it does to us. They could even infer two-dimensional shape from that information. If a square and a triangle are looking at each other, they'd see the difference. This seems a lot like our own universe and our own experience. Maybe curvature is similar too? If flatland was actually the surface of a giant sphere, would two-dimensional beings be able to measure that curvature from the inside? Yes, actually. All they have to do is measure something called the Riemann curvature, which has to do with how the space maps onto the flattest possible space. Remember in the one-dimensional case how we could map this circle onto a flat line? All we had to do was snip the circle and flatten it. There was no distortion. We can do similar maps in two dimensions, but sometimes there's distortion. The Riemann curvature tells us how much distortion there would be. If you take a flat 2D space and bend it into a cylinder, there's no distortion in the grid. Distance measurements still make sense. All parallel lines stay parallel. The cylinder has zero intrinsic curvature, which means zero Riemann curvature. Wait, what? How can it have zero Roman curvature? It, it, it's Riemann, not Roman. And don't forget, there are two types of curvature. Any curvature you're seeing here is only because the 2D surface is embedded in a 3D space. It's not intrinsic to the 2D surface. It's extrinsic to the 3D space. <laughs> anyway, a cylindrical space doesn't have intrinsic curvature. If you're living in one of these two spaces, then you can't tell the difference. But if the space is something like a torus or a sphere, there's definitely intrinsic curvature. You could tell the difference. We'll be using the sphere for the rest of the video because, well, it's easier to understand than a torus. The Riemann curvature is a tensor. In two-dimensional space, each of the four indices can take on two possible values. X and Y, or theta and phi, or one and two, or whatever you decided to call your axes. That means the curvature tensor has two to the four, or 16 components. For a spherical surface though, 12 of them are zero. The other four are the same, plus or minus one over R squared, everywhere on the surface. Out of 16 total components, there's really only one independent non-zero component. That R is the radius of the sphere, which the two-dimensional beings wouldn't be able to see. But one of them could measure the Riemann curvature and infer it. Um, how? Parallel transport! Come on, d doesn't everyone get excited about parallel transport? I know I do. Nerd! And anyway, let's imagine we're all tiny beings moving around on the surface of a giant sphere. Oh, uh, I guess we don't have to imagine that hard, do we? When we're standing on the surface of the Earth, it looks pretty flat, but that's because we're only seeing a tiny fraction of its surface area. About 0.00001% of it. That two-dimensional being might have a similar problem in their two-dimensional space. They think their space is flat. But then we use our omnipotent powers to pop one of them out. They're now free to move around in three dimensions and look down at Flatland. To their surprise, they see that it's curved. Now they know their space isn't actually flat, but if we put them back in, they're gonna wanna tell their friends. Unfortunately, their friends are ignorant of this fact because they lack the three-dimensional experience. This is where parallel transport comes in. Say they map out a closed path, like this triangle, for example and they pick a vector to carry around with them, like their initial velocity. Leaving copies of it behind for reference, they walk around the path with their vector. With every step they take, they make sure to keep their vector parallel to the vector they left behind in the previous step. That's why we call it parallel transport. They continue until they return to their original starting point. 
That's when they check the vector they've been transporting against the one they left behind. If the vectors are at an angle to each other, the space is curved. If they're not at an angle, this does not prove the space is flat. It might just be that their path was too small. They could choose a bigger path and try again, or they could just go around the smaller path a bunch of times until the angle accumulates. Either way, if they find an angle, it proves the space is curved. What does this have to do with Raymond's curvature anyway? It's Riemann curvature. Ugh, what does this have to do with Riemann curvature? Everything. Those little parallel transports are represented by something called the Christoffel symbols. And those determine the Riemann curvature tensor. A tensor that has one independent non-zero component in two dimensions, six independent non-zero components in three dimensions, and 20 independent non-zero components in four dimensions. We may never truly understand what it means to be a three-dimensional being in a four-dimensional space-time, but we can imagine one-dimensional beings in a two-dimensional space-time, or even two-dimensional beings in a three-dimensional space-time. Lower dimensions are definitely something we have a handle on. They can give us a rough idea of issues we may run into trying to measure curvature in our own universe. As long as we can parallel transport vectors around our own space-time, we can ultimately find the Riemann curvature of that space-time. That's a big deal because you'll find contracted versions of that tensor in Einstein's equation. The equation that tells us gravity is curvature. If you don't understand how curvature works, then understanding gravity is kind of hopeless. So if you have any questions, please ask in the comments. Thanks for liking and sharing this video. Don't forget to subscribe if you'd like to keep up with us. And until next time, remember, it's okay to be a little crazy. Brilliant is a problem-solving based website and app with a hands-on approach, with over 60 interactive courses in math, science, and computer science. Try adding some learning structure to your day by setting a goal to improve yourself, and then work at that goal just a little bit every day. All of Brilliant's courses have storytelling, code writing, interactive challenges, and problems to solve. If you watch this video, you clearly like to challenge yourself. You could try Brilliant's course on vector calculus, where you'll learn about important vectors in three-dimensional space that tell us a lot about the curvature of paths. You can also keep your mind stimulated with their daily challenges. Brilliant puzzles you, surprises you, and expands your understanding of the modern world. If this sounds like a service you'd like to use, go to brilliant.org slash science asylum today. The first 200 subscribers will get 20% off an annual subscription. To everyone asking if space-time has a breaking point, no, it doesn't. Einstein's equation is always proportional, even inside the event horizon of a black hole. Anyway, thanks for watching.